Watch this. Idaho's governor has used his pen quite a few times already this session. Today, he used the red stamp of disapproval on his first bill of the year, his veto taking tens of thousands of dollars away from teachers. He left Ukraine in search of a better life in America, but when war broke out, this Idaho man went back to help the rest of his family get out and do the same. Bit of a mixed bag for college basketball in Idaho today. We got your winners and losers and what to do if your team lost. Why you can still come out smelling like a rose in Rose City. All right, Governor Little digging into his desk for something that doesn't usually see a lot of light of, or light of day, I guess. The proverbial red veto stamp. We call it proverbial because, well, it's not really a red stamp. But Little did sign his first veto of the year today. He denied a proposal to allow a group of 23 Idaho school administrators to collect incentive money that was meant to go to teachers. Little says the move doesn't mean he doesn't want to invest in education. And if that seems a bit contradictory, well, we'll let Joe Paris explain why and what it means. The first veto of the year is in the books for Idaho Governor Brad Little. He actually gave me the courtesy of calling me in and telling me yesterday that he was going to uh, had a problem with the bill and why he was going to veto the bill. Twin Falls Republican Representative Lance Clow sponsors the now vetoed legislation. Clow says his legislation is designed to get teacher incentive payments to administrators that recently transitioned from their roles as teachers. That incentive money is part of the career ladder, a program called Master Educator Premiums. It was personal because I knew a couple of the teachers a new one specifically that came to my attention and brought it to my attention about what I described as more inequity in the way funding formulas work or how we how our compensation programs work. The master educator premiums were designed a few years ago to reward Idaho teachers who showed the highest levels of mastery and in instructional techniques and impactful work in the classroom. Premiums were set for $4,000 a year for three years per teacher. To qualify, teachers needed to build portfolios to exhibit their work. The program FAQ fully acknowledges that creating that portfolio would take 20 to 40 hours per year for three years. Teachers who went down that path but later got promotions into administrative roles lost eligibility, despite the dozens and dozens of hours working towards the program. But they're still helping the classrooms. You know, many of the assistant principals and principals, they end up being substitutes when there's a shortage. They, they're in the classrooms, they're helping all the time. They're working with kids, and I felt that awfully close to the same idea of what a teacher was. In his veto letter, Governor Little writes, quote, Master educator premiums were intended to be an incentive to keep teachers in the classroom. By providing them to teachers who moved outside of teaching roles, this appears to be at odds with the original purpose of this program. He adds, quote, I share the goal of ensuring all our educators are appropriately compensated and rewarded. A more appropriate way of doing that is focusing on pay and benefits. Governor Little encourages lawmakers to pass education budgets that he suggests in his state of the state. Stakeholders weighed in too, including Lane McAnally, president of the Idaho Education Association. He writes in a statement to KTVB that, quote, any opportunity to reward educators for their essential work, which this bill did, is always a step in the right direction. However, our members also wholeheartedly agree with the governor's reasoning in vetoing this legislation. Focusing on pay and benefits is the best way to ensure Idaho's educators are properly compensated for their importance to students, families, state, and society. I understood his argument. I just thought mine was a better one. And it is our taxpayers' money, and so it's a matter, I'm looking at it as an equity fairness thing, and the governor's looking at it to be fiscally responsible. Um, and I don't know which one of us is right. We both think we are. Representative Klaus says he brought the legislation to reward educators who put in a lot of time to be a part of the program. I, I've told teachers that retired and left and whatever, said, you don't qualify anymore. That we're paying money to help kids. At least these assistant principals and vice principal or vice principals and principals, they're still helping the kids and their skills and talents are, are still of value to the state. The legislation passed the Idaho House 52 to 15 with three absent. It passed the Senate 32 to three. Those numbers could be good news on a possible veto override vote, which would need two thirds of both chambers. But Representative Klaus says it is wait and see. Veto overrides can be rare. Sometimes people are a little reluctant to override a veto, even if they voted for the legislation the first go round.
All right, Joe, we're talking like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to about two dozen teachers across the state, which doesn't seem like a significant amount unless, of course, you were one of those to receive it. And based on what we heard, like, eh, I can understand why you vetoed it. I mean, was this expected? You know, I, I think there was a lot of support in, in the Senate and the House. So I think there were people that were surprised today that this was vetoed. But uh, the governor gave his explanation, and there's been some critics of the bill itself that said, you know, this is for only 23 people. Maybe we could take this money and we could give it to other people and we could spread it out more fairly. Now, uh, the converse to that, as you heard Representative Clown talk about, is that you have this group of 23 teachers who spent dozens and dozens of hours. And, you know, the state said, it should take 20 to 40 hours to put these portfolios together. Um, some teachers I spoke with in recent years said it took well beyond that. Oh. So there's teachers that worked really hard to be a part of this program, worked you know, 40, 60 hours to get $4,000 for that year. They put that work in, but then they got a promotion to an administrator, so they were no longer eligible. Representative Clow was really just uh, arguing for the fact that, you know, they deserve something. They, do, they still deserve it. So in terms of a veto, though, he tells me that early next week, they're probably going to discuss it. The numbers are there. If you were to take all the votes, yes, that voted yes sure. on, the, on the legislation and then take that for the two thirds, the numbers do work. But as you heard, sometimes lawmakers are reluctant to vote on an override. A passing vote doesn't always necessarily mean a veto vote. Correct. All right. Thanks, Joe. Well, after vetoing that bill, Governor Little signed a few others into law today, including one that's part of his leading Idaho plan the $252 million transportation funding bill. It includes $200 million for bridge repairs, which is enough to fix a third of Idaho's deficient bridges across the state. Another 10 million is gonna to go towards safe pedestrian crossings, another good thing. That money will come from the state's general fund and will go directly to local districts. Some of that money will be used this fiscal year. In the coming days, Governor Little says he will sign another $200 million bill with that money going towards road maintenance. So yesterday we told you about the state of Oregon stepping forward and telling Idahoans it would include $15 million in their state budget to help fund abortions and travel related expenses for those seeking abortions. Today, another of our neighbors doing something similar. Washington State Governor Jay Inslee signed what's known as the Affirm Washington Abortion Access Act into law. It would allow advanced nurse practitioners and physicians assistants to perform abortion procedures, not just doctors. It also protects abortion providers from prosecution under laws like the one that's set to go into effect in Idaho. To the citizens of Idaho, if Idaho will not stand up for your constitutional rights, we will. And this bill will make it more, uh, more able to do so from uh, our, our folks in Idaho. As for that bill that will make it illegal in Idaho, well, Governor Little has one more day to sign it. That would be Senate Bill 1309 before it goes into effect without his signature. He could just let it go, not sign it, and it would go into effect automatically. Governor Inslee said before, uh, should I, should, he has said before, should Idaho's Texas-style abortion bill pass, which it did, the Evergreen State is ready to provide that relief, and now he's showing that. Their new allowances will take effect in June. Idaho's law will take effect 30 days after it is signed or not signed, 30 days after tomorrow, I guess. The war in Ukraine has been going on for three weeks now, and already 691 civilians have been killed. But according to the United Nations Human Rights Office, that number is likely much higher. Another 1,200 others have been wounded, and so far, more than 3 million people have fled the country, including a family of a Boise man. Our Katya Spe uh, Stepovic spoke with him about how he took matters into his own hands to try to bring his loved ones to safety. They just couldn't leave their communities, their jobs, uh, their children's, uh, you know, education choices. Um, so it was hard. Volodymyr Temchenko grew up in the city of Kyiv. Beautiful city, you know, very peaceful. Yeah. Where his parents and cousins still remained even days after the bombing began. They, they were trying to postpone until the last moment, but usually like a bomb or a rocket or something terrible like a death made like the last was the last drop and it was over two weeks ago his family decided enough was enough and Vladimir left Boise to bring his parents to the U.S. and the rest of his family to safety in Lithuania Poland and Italy first few days um, there were no big organizations at the border people who were fleeing um, in thousands that were lining up on the other side to go through the bureaucracy of you know going through the border. But he couldn't go inside the country because then he would be forced to fight for it. Men were turned away. 
So only women and children and um, eld like elders over 60 could cross. Leaving Kiev was not easy. Uh, leaving it by train involved, you know, being in a crowd of thousands of people. Leaving it by car meant, you know, multi-hour drive, um, um, no gasoline and logistically it was difficult to just leave. Even as civilian buildings were still being bombed, he said his family still felt a strong sense of community, making the decision to leave difficult. The community was so good. I mean, they were together making Molotov cocktails, they were digging trenches, so she felt support. And, um, but I think that support and safety was a little bit, um, superficial because they lived right across a hill from um, from the airport that was bombed and paratrooped in constantly and so it was a false safety feeling of safety. While Volodymyr was waiting for his parents to arrive by train in Hungary to then board a plane to Atlanta where his sister lives, he helped other Ukrainian families seeking safety. While his family may be in a safe place now, the noises and images of their beloved hometown will never fade. They were scared of every loud noise. If airplane was flying, you know, they were emotionally, you know, mm. disturbed. So I think it will be still hard for them, even though they only had three, four days of the war that they had to see. It's hard for them um, to, to come down their subconscious and nervous system, you know, uh, that still remembers the um, explosions. I can imagine adrenaline is still kind of going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're in this country, maybe too soon to talk about or even think about, but do they plan on staying in this country or going back? Well, recently for Ukrainian refugees coming to the U.S., Brian, they get a visitor visa that is good for 18 months long. Now, if they stay that long, kind of depends on the future of Ukraine, right? And they are very anxious to get back, at least his parents. Now, as for his cousins in other countries, they have three years with a right to live and work policy, which is a recent EU response to Europe's biggest refugee crisis this century. So they could be there for a while. And a lot of European countries kind of easing their immigration policies because of what's happening. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Katya. Ah, yes, it is St. Patrick's Day, and if you're planning on celebrating tonight, or maybe you already did, going to carry it into the evening, chances are you might hear the, uh, the sounds of Ireland out and about, the sounds of pipes and drums. Originally, they're used by military organizations to mark time for marching and for signaling commands. But since the early 1900s, pipes and drums have turned into more of a social function. 
And there are several groups that perform all over the city playing them. You usually see them in parades and other social functions. In 2008, the Boise Fire Department created its own Pipes and Drum Corps. They practice on their own time and are often asked to perform on St. Patrick's Day. Photojournalist Kevin Esslinger caught up with local 149 troop as they rehearsed for their five performances they planned tonight. We're all firefighters for the city of Boise, and our day job is doing firefighter stuff, you know, rescues and helping people. When we get together as a group, we're dear friends and we love each other and we take care of each other. And this is that one opportunity where we get to hang out and not have to be at work. It just brings our relationships to a whole new level. The pipe band started, you know, we're to honor our fallen brothers and sisters. Most of our events are really serious, promotion ceremonies, you know, celebrations of life. St. Patrick's is special because it's, it's goof off time. We get to just smile and play some of our fun music and, and interact with the crowd and uh, just have a great evening. That's the most difficult instrument in the world to learn. There's so much going on, you've got to breathe, fill the bag, squeeze the bag, keep the pressure the same, put another breath in, walk around. Don't forget to play the music, breathe, squeeze, walk, play the music. So there's four or five things happening at the same time. In my experience, no matter where you're at, if you hear bagpipes, you kind of, your ear perks up and you're like, what? Huh, bagpipes somewhere. Um, that's something I can provide and, and many people can. But we've got about a 20 minute show at each stop that we make interacting with the crowd, laughing, having a good time, raise a glass. We've been locked up for two years. It's time to get back out in the community and be nice to each other and, and all smile in the same room. That's true, accordions, bagpipes, you hear them and you, you pay attention to that. These guys have already performed twice today, but you still have time to catch them in action tonight. They're going to be at Bear Island Brewing in just a few minutes, starting at 530 this evening. Then at 630, they're off and be performing at Cloud O Brewing, excuse me, Cloud Nine Brewing, excuse me. And then they're gonna be at McCleary, of course, they're gonna be at McCleary's Club on State Street, right? They start there at 7.30. They have three performances tomorrow as well. So it's a whole, well, it's pre-weekend fun for those folks.
Big month for college basketball. Of course. I mean, it's why they call it March Met. Can't say that. That's one of those terms trademarked by the NCAA, which is fine because the big men's basketball tournament we're talking about is taking place in Kansas City. That's where the College of Idaho Coyotes are playing in the NAIA National Tournament for the 24th time. They even won the Division II title back in 1996, so a lot of history there. Speaking of history, NAIA tourney is the oldest college basketball tournament in the country. Started by Mr. Basketball himself, Dr. James Naismith, in 1937. It was the first national organization to integrate their intercollegiate postseason in 1948 as well. And the most valuable player award handed out since 1939, named after Chuck Taylor. So yeah, it's a pretty big deal. A lot of basketball ties. Oh yeah, the Oats, they pulled off the round of 16 win in the game, 71-66 over the Grace College Lancers. So the Cascade Conference Coach of the Year, Colby Blaine, is going to take his 32 win Yotes against Loyola University New Orleans and former teammate Jalen Galloway. That game takes place on Saturday. So yeah, we are on the Coyote crazy train right now. March Madness indeed. Then yeah, there was, an, there was another 64 team tournament that tipped off today. I know you probably watched it. First round of the NCAA tournament taking place in Portland for the eight seated Boise State Broncos. And much like this picture portrays, a confounded loss to the ninth seated Memphis Tigers. Too many second chances for the Tigers, not enough points for the Broncos. 64-53 the final there. Yeah, had us all kind of going, what? So now what? Well, Bronco fans, if you're in Portland, you now have an open Saturday. So scalp those second session tickets and check out what the Rose City has to offer instead. What to do when your team exits too early? Well, maybe you still have some basketball to get out of your system. Sign up for the three-on-three -three tournament at the Old Town Chinatown Block Party starting at 11 a.m. There's also the Portland Mercury's Highball to drown your first round failure sorrows. They call it a one-of-a-kind booze-tacular. Basically, it's a bar crawl where each stop you'll find specially crafted cocktails for just six bucks. Or you can check out the Portland Saturday Market at Tom McCall Waterfront Park. It's an open-air bazaar that's been around since 1974, showcasing arts and crafts by Pacific Northwest artisans. Yay, arts and crafts! Maybe music is more your thing. Then catch Shannon and the Clams at the Wonder Ballroom. They'll be coming to Treefort next week, but just kind of look at this as a preview. Was today one of the worst days of the year as a Bronco fan? Well, sign up for the 18th annual Worst Day of the Year costume bike ride for Sunday. There's a 15-mile urban course, or if you're looking to punish yourself for Boise State's loss, there's a 42-mile hill climb challenge. Either way, there's a brewery involved. Or maybe you want something more mellow to match your melancholy. You could hit the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival in Woodburn. It's 40 acres of tulip fields. There's even a windmill that will remind you of Holland. At least you won't be reminded of hoops.
of snow geese are back out there by the Snake River. Check them out if you ever get out there. It's a pretty cool sight, especially when they all take off at once. All right, let's get to some of your comments you sent in uh, during today's show. Even some questions like this one from Marty. Would the person getting an abortion in Oregon or Washington be protected from lawsuits upon returning to Idaho? Well, the Idaho law only is, works in Idaho because you can't enforce another law in another state, and it only applies to doctors that can get sued should they perform an, adoption, uh, an abortion. Correct me if I'm incorrect. Wasn't abortion legalized to protect the woman from having to search alternative ways? It was legalized to save her. Yes, they'd have to go to some back alley place out of the country where things may not be as, well, you know, protected. Yes, that was the point. Unfortunately, the Boise Fire Department used the Scottish bagpipes, not the Irish bagpipes on St. Patrick's Day. That's true, but you know what? On a day like today, we'll take what we can get. It's okay. Not a big deal. How about this one? No cre uh, green plaid blazer today. I'm a little disappointed, Brian. Aaron Go Bra says, Gary, yeah, I don't have one of those in my, uh, I guess, my wardrobe. But I do have some beads, and I've got some cool glasses, and it is St. Patrick's Day. And that's all I have to say about that.